Finance. Hey, welcome everyone to the Financial Independence Podcast, the podcast where I interview some of the best and brightest in personal finance to find out how they achieved financial independence. On today's show, I'm excited to introduce Scott Trench from BiggerPockets.com. Scott's someone who came on my radar a few years ago because Mindy Jensen, aka Mrs. 1500 from 1500days.com, mentioned quite a few times that I needed to get her colleague, Scott, on the podcast. She said he's a 20-something who's doing incredible things with real estate and investing and finances in general, so I needed to talk to him. And anytime Mindy gives such a glowing recommendation for someone, I definitely check them out. So that's what I did. I downloaded an audiobook version of his book, Set for Life, and I really enjoyed it. The thing I liked most about the book was that he broke the journey to financial independence down into three distinct stages, each with their own focus. And this is something that I really am looking forward to diving into today in the interview because I think it's a really powerful way to make the journey to financial independence not as daunting. And I'm also looking forward to exploring some of the strategies that he used personally to get to the stage that he's at today, like house hacking and real estate investing. So without further delay, Scott, thanks very much for being here. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me, Brandon. I'm very excited to be here. Yeah, this is a long time coming. So um, I'm not sure how long you've known Mindy Jensen, but I think ever since she got introduced to you, she's been like, Brandon, you have to get him on the show. He's this young guy that's doing all these crazy things. So you're you're in your mid-20s, right? Yeah, I'm 27. So I, I met Mindy probably like two or three years ago, and I actually work with her here at Bigger Pockets. Yeah. So Mindy has been like, you got to get him on the podcast. He's doing some amazing stuff, which I'm really excited to talk to you about. So let's uh, let's dive in. What what did Mindy see in you, do you think, and what caused her to come to me and say, hey, you need to talk to this guy? Well, I think, I think that we both share a lot of interests in personal finance. And we both have a kind of a similar approach to money in general. I think it starts with a basis in frugality, uh, but then it, there is a, an aggressive investing component. And both Mindy and I are a little bit more uh, how do I describe it? A little bit. We try to be a little bit more creative and adventurous with our investment and money management than maybe just passively investing in index funds. I think that's why we're attracted to real estate. And you know, I have my eye on maybe branching out into some other different types of investments. And I know that she does a lot of private lending um, and and other various kind of creative ways to kind of invest and maybe get diversified or different or higher returns than she can with just stocks. So I think that that's where our friendship kind of kicked off and. Still very similar mindset on life and finance and real estate in general. Nice. And and yeah, you're 27 and you've done a ton of crazy, amazing stuff so far. And you're now president of Bigger Pockets, which is a huge congratulations to you. Yeah, I got promoted to president of Bigger Pockets maybe last Tuesday, I think. So I don't even remember. It's been a whirlwind since then. So it's the, kind of the opposite of FI at this point. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm all in. I'm like very now, you know, working very long hours and trying to figure out how to grow the company and um, and all that kind of stuff. But it's it's very exciting and it's like the perfect world for me because I just love Bigger Pockets and I love helping spread the message of financial independence to as many places as I can. And you so. can do it while you're on the clock. So you're talking to me. And I do it while I'm on the clock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great. And your boss, he, your boss was on the show. Uh, Josh Dorkin was on episode number 23. So yeah, he, that's right. he seems like a good boss anyway, but uh, <laughs> that's, that's awesome, man. That's, that's great. Congratulations. Yeah, Josh has definitely kind of achieved the dream here. So he's kind of stepped aside and um, well, he's he has some family things that are going on, but he, uh, so we're wishing him the best with those. But uh, he's definitely in a position where he's able to kind of step aside and step out of the day to day and have a young upstart like me kind of do, do some of that for him. That's cool. So how did you get interested in real estate? So I got interested in real estate as a byproduct of being interested in financial independence in the first place. So I started out working at a Fortune 500 company. I wasn't really interested in that line of work. And so uh, well, I was interested in that line of work, but I didn't want to be tied to it for 40 years. So as part of my effort actually to become a better financial analyst at my job, I started listening to and reading all this content on finance and kind of discovered the concept of personal finance at some point. And then I actually stumbled upon your podcast, the very first episode with Mr. Money Mustache. And once I heard that, everything clicked for me and I was like, this is it. This is what I need to be doing and how I need to be moving forward with my life and with my finances. This is why I was already fairly frugal, but this is why I'm saving. This is what I want to do with money. This is why I've studied finance and, and in general in college and with my you know start of my career. This is it. And so thank you for that. Uh, thank, thanks to both you and, and him. Yeah, that's absolutely crazy. 
but yeah, so th- so that that interest in personal finance is kind of what spurred my my ability to save and my the accumulation of the first twenty to twenty five thousand dollars for me, and. I wanted to do a little bit more with that than maybe invest in index funds again with just a kind of a standard 8 to 10 percent long-term average return. I wanted to try to see if I could do much better than that. And that is where I became interested in real estate and started listening to Bigger Pockets and uh, becoming a, a fan of the company there. That's very cool. So I published that episode way back in May of 2012. So do you think you, you, know, you stumbled upon it shortly after it was published or was this something that happened a little bit later? No, in May of 2012, I was graduating from college and getting ready to. No, I was. I graduated in college in May of 2013, so I was still drinking too, way too much beer and trying <laughs> to have too much fun when you when you were published that. But uh, so I spent all my money throughout the rest of my college, all, all the money I saved up working in summers and all that, on fun in college, and then a three month backpacking trip when I graduated. So I started with basically zero, three thousand dollars in savings. Uh, when I started my career. But within three months of starting my career, my introduction to the real world, I became very interested in, <laughs> again, in the concept of personal finance. And your show, that's when I found your show, is sometime in that time frame. I want to say it was probably November or December of 2013 is when I actually listened to your show wow. and got these all kicked off. That's very cool. So you mentioned your first 25K, and this brings up a really cool thing that I liked in your book, which I haven't even mentioned yet, but uh, you wrote a great book called Set for Life, and you're kind enough to send it to me. And I actually enjoyed the audio version of it in the gym. So you were my gym companion for a good week or two. Oh, wow. I'm repaying the favor of you being in my head. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, I really enjoyed it. But one of the things I loved most about it was how you broke it down into sort of three phases. And the first phase was, you know, getting that first 25k the next phase is getting the first 100K. And then finally, the next phase is getting from 100K to financial freedom. So I really like how you structured it. So would you mind talking a little bit about that first stage? Yeah, sure. So one of the problems that a lot of people have, I think, when it comes to finance is they're unable to take any risk whatsoever. They're unable to take advantage of opportunity. And the reason for that is because they have no cushion. They have nothing to fall back on. So if you're, you know, suppose that you're making $50,000 a year. If you save, you know, 500 bucks a month, right, which is actually a pretty good savings rate. That's about, you know, a little over 10% of your savings. You're not going to, you're going to have, you, that means you spend around $4,000 a month. So you're not going to be able to even last one month without your job if you're starting from scratch until eight months have passed and really getting to that one, you know, six weeks time frame by the end of a year. So you have no financial runway. If you lose your job, you're screwed. You run out of money and you have to go and find similar paying work as your only option. But if you're able to start increasing that savings rate, you accumulate this cushion, this what I call financial runway in Set for Life, which allows you to live without the need for wage paying work uh, on that. And f- what I believe is that for, you know, and my book is written for a very specific audience. It's written for a median income earner that is starting with little to no assets, but wants financial freedom. So some people are starting from a position where they already have a good 25,000 saved up or through whatever fortune that they've, you know, whatever they've done previous to this point. But if you're starting from that point, you don't really have the option of going out and starting a business because you're working full time and starting a business is hard work and unlikely to be successful on a part time effort in the short run. Um, There's plenty of exceptions to that, and I'm not discounting that. I just think it's lower odds of success than maybe focusing on savings first. You're also not likely to get a big raise at your job at work in the next, you know, within the next year. You know, people doubling their income in a corporate type situation is very, it's it's not heard of. It's it's unlikely. So your best, and you also have nothing to invest. You can't get a higher return on your invested dollars if you have nothing to invest. So you really have to start somewhere. And I think for for that median income earner. That's starting with zero. It's it's with that savings position. Now, once you accumulate that, once you achieve a high savings rate and accumulate maybe six months to a year or more of this financial runway, options begin to present themselves in your life. Things like you can go and take a job that pays you 40K instead of 50K, but offers you a chance at a big bonus at the end of the year. Or you can go work for free for, for an entrepreneur that you really admire and go learn a valuable skill set. 
Or you can just take that $25,000 and invest or house hack the way I did. And that's kind of where we get start getting into part two there, which is twenty five to 100K. But do you have any other questions about the... Yeah, yeah, the that, that's that's awesome. And, and yeah, the, the, the main focus in that first 25K is frugality, which as you talk about in the book, like a dollar saved is better than a dollar earned because obviously you're not, you've already paid tax on that dollar that you're saving and you know it's worth more to you than a dollar earned because you would pay a bunch of tax on it and have to do work to get it. So... I think that's really important. And I think focusing on frugality at that stage absolutely is going to be the biggest impact you can have on your finances. Yeah. And I think, you know, a dollar saved is better than a dollar earned because of that tax advantage. But also a dollar saved, at least a dollar of lifestyle, you know, if you can reduce your average monthly spending by a thousand dollars, that's better than increasing your average monthly income by a thousand dollars for a couple of reasons. One, you're accumulating that all in savings, which is a 100% gain, right? Because it's after-tax savings that you're accumulating. But two, you're decreasing the amount of money that you need to produce financial runway. So you might need $25,000 in total cash liquidity to finance your $2,000 a month lifestyle, but you'll need about $48,000 to finance your $4,000 a month lifestyle. So it gets harder to save and you need a way more the more your average monthly spending increases. Oh, that's yeah, that's a great way to look at it. So you had mentioned when you hit that twenty five k, you know, stability level. You had mentioned you know you could get a job that pays less salary but has a bigger bonus potential, or you could you know go and work at a startup or things like that. And you mentioned in the book something called scalable careers, which you know that's a great phrase that I don't think I've really heard before. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So. When I was, you know, my first job, I was at a Fortune 500 company as a financial analyst one. And I knew very clearly that around the 18 month mark, give or take a few months, depending on my performance, I was going to get a promotion to financial analyst two. And my salary when I started was $48,000. And I knew that my salary at financial analyst two would be about $56,000 to $58,000, again, depending on performance. Right. Well, my goal was financial freedom. And I wanted it as soon as possible. Earning a $8,000 raise after a year is is great. I know a lot of people that would be happy with that with with a raise of that level, you know. But that was not going to get me expediently towards my goal of several hundred thousand to a million dollar net worth and, you know, several thousand dollars a month in passive cash flow. So that's not scalable. And and the, the step after financial analyst 2, of course, is financial analyst 3, mm-hmm. then senior financial analyst, then finance manager, senior finance manager, director of finance, senior director, and so on, all the way up to CFO of a Fortune 500 company. And that's the best case scenario is that you go through all of those rungs of the ladder in 20 years. You know, that's not fast enough. It's not it's, it's, in my opinion, as a saver who was able to accumulate a year of financial runway within a year, that was a risky career because I knew that I was not going to have any chance to live up to what I deemed my potential to be. But on the other hand, if I wasn't saving, if I had no financial runway, it would be too risky to leave. And so what I'm trying to do is with Set for Life and with some of the other things I'm doing is try to help people – put themselves into a position where they're saving enough, where leaving a career track like that, where they have very limited upside becomes the bigger risk than taking a chance on something that they believe to be a good opportunity. And that's why I love these like three distinct phases so much. Because when I started on the road to financial independence, I was, thankfully, I was already in stage three, like, you know, I was just working towards that financial freedom. But I didn't realize that passing those first two stages, you know, my first 25k and my first 100k gave me so many more options and so much more power to to make that journey quicker and more enjoyable. And that's why I really like how you laid out the book is because it's like, okay, yeah, you may not have that much money to invest and you may feel like it's a long way out, but you know, you get to this 25k or this one year of runway and now you have a lot more options and you could drastically change your life for the better. Yeah, I think I think that's exactly the, exactly right. And once you have that financial runway, you know, moving into step two here, we're trying to get to about a hundred thousand dollars in investable liquidity. 
And once you get to $100,000 in investable liquidity, now how you invest that money begins to be become really important. So the goal is to go from a year of financial runway, which is a very modest goal that you can grind out over maybe a year to 18 months, depending on where you're starting from, what your income is and where your expenses are, to a goal that has a lot less certainty. It's a lot more there's a lot more factors, more luck is involved in rapidly going from 25K to $100,000 than there is from going from zero to $25,000. And so it's all about increasing your odds of success, I guess, at this point. And so I believe that two things are likely to help people increase their odds of success at going rapidly from 25K in net worth to $100,000 are one, go find a new job, go find a career or an opportunity that you believe offers you the potential to scale, but will not allow you to lose money on a monthly basis. And then two, house hack. Cool. Yeah. So yeah, can you want to describe that again? Um, I know I've had, you know, Chad Carson on the show and we've talked about it in the 1500s. And, uh, but for those who have made not have heard that episode, could you just describe what house hacking is? Sure. So house hacking, as I define it, is buying a investment piece of investment real estate that will make sense as a rental property, as a cash flowing rental property for you after you move out. Um, or otherwise using your housing to build wealth. So for example, a house, a house hack as, you know, the way I look at it through my lens was I bought a duplex for $240,000 here in Denver, uh, in about two, late 2014. Uh, and I put down $12,000 and I got a, what, $236,000 loan, something like that after the fees and all that. Uh, and so I put down 5% with an FHA loan. My mortgage payment was 1550 and my rents were 1150 from the other side and 550 for my side. So if you're following that, I was collecting $1,700 in rent on a 1550 mortgage. Nice. So after the other expenses that went into maintaining the property and fixing some things up myself, I was probably breaking even or maybe paying a little bit out of pocket to live on a, on a monthly basis. But that's a huge improvement from paying hundreds or thousands of dollars in rent per month. And so that's like the biggest hack that I can think of, like the biggest trick that a median income earner can do on the side to drastically cut their expenses and then, you know, kind of automatically build, put yourself in position to have a, a significant cash flowing asset after a year or two. Yeah. That I, you mentioned them in the book, you're like turn your biggest expense into an income producing asset. And I think that's really power, powerful to think of it that way. It's like, yeah, this is, this could be your basic, biggest expense. And especially if you're renting or if you go out and buy a, you know, your dream home right out of college so that some people do, you know, that is a huge expense. But what you're talking about is, yeah, turning that into an income producing asset instead. So not only are you not spending money on that big major expense, but you're actually earning money from it, which obviously is going to get you to that 100K a lot quicker than the normal person. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you talk about um, average American household spending, 33% of that, the biggest chunk of the pie is going to be in housing, 17% is in transportation, 13% is in food, and then one third, that was two thirds that I just described there, housing, transportation, and food. One third is everything else, fun, entertainment, um, you know, uh, healthcare, insurance, all of that falls into that last third. So people always think that these are, that's where they need to focus on their finances in order to achieve a high savings rate and rapidly accelerate toward financial independence. But that's wrong. It's just that the math doesn't, doesn't work like that. The math, the math is telling us that the biggest parts you're spending are in housing and transportation. And if you can house hack and like me, you know, I house hacked close to work so I could bike to work, you know, you're able to eliminate basically 50% lop off half of your expenses in one single investment. And again, yes, you're producing that, uh, you're, you're buying in such a way that it will make a smart cash flowing asset for you once you move on and move out of that property. Very cool. So that was, that was that your first property then that duplex in Denver? Yep. That was my first property. I bought it in Northeast Denver and, um, things worked out. I moved out a couple of years later and it currently rents for $1,400 or the mortgage is currently $1,400 because I refinanced. Um, I was able to reduce my, my monthly payment and then the rents are about $2,600 a month. Wow. That's fantastic. <laughs> Have you bought any other properties since then? Yep. So I, I live in another duplex doing the same thing. And I also have a quadplex now that I bought as a regular investment property. So I'm trying to buy like one every 12 to 18 months and kind of just sustain that system. Wow. And, and how's that going in Denver? I know the it's a really hot real estate market these days. 
Uh, it's going. It's it's been going pretty well. I think that it's very it's increasingly difficult. At the time that we're recording this, I'm finding it very difficult to find properties, and I think it's going to take me a, a, a good bit of time here. But as long as I can find a property that cash flows in the sense where I, you know, basically have very very good odds at having long term five to eight hundred dollars a month plus in cash flow on you know, on a fifty to hundred thousand dollar investment, you know, that's maybe not the best cash on cash return, but I do believe that I can see some solid appreciation over a 30 year holding period in Denver. So if I kind of maintain my system of dollar cost averaging through real estate, um, I believe that I'll have a good result at the end. Very cool. And how, how does, uh, the duplex compare to the quadplex? So the, so the quadplex that I purchased, I bought it for three three hundred fifty five thousand. It wasn't in the nicest area. Uh, the rents there are eight hundred dollars per month on each of the units, and the mortgage is about seventeen hundred dollars. So if you're following, that's thirty two hundred dollars in rent on a seventeen hundred dollar mortgage, and I have a couple of other expenses there as well. I believe I I currently was able to get remodel and get one of the units up to nine twenty five. And I believe that by the end of next year, so that's the end of 2019, that I'll be able to get approximately $925 to $1,000 per unit, plus I can pass on the utility fees to the tenants. Oh, wow. So it'll take me a year or two to, you know, to get to that point because I don't want to kick any tenants out or anything or raise the rent too quickly on them. But once I've got that stabilized after a year or two hold, I think I can, uh, I'll, I'll have a very, very nice cash flow on top of what is already a satisfactory cash flow. Very cool. So if somebody's interested in getting started in house hacking, do you think, what would you recommend as far as, you know, do you think a duplex is easier to manage initially, or do you think go straight for something like the quadplex if you have, if you have the capital to invest? I think that house, one of the great things about house hacking is it's a huge spectrum. So the only criteria that I have that I think that you should really kind of strictly enforce is will this property make sense right now, the day you buy it as an investment property, if you don't live there? Because if you don't have that option, then you are stuck. You have to live there until things appreciate or rents go up or, you know, the property uh, goes up and, and, and you, ha you either have to be able to sell it or live there happily. But if you're house hacking correctly, you have three options. And this is the real power of it in, in a non-financial sense is that, you, you know, I could, I could continue living in that property happily forever. I could sell it at a gain alongside all the other homeowners in the area, or I could rent it out. And in a good market, that's not so important. But in a bad market, it's really important because in a bad market, you can't sell. And so if you can't sell, then your only option as a homeowner that or, or a house hacker that hasn't bought a property that would make sense as a rental is to continue living in the property and paying it. But if you can if it can cash flow as a as a piece of investment real estate, then you can always decide to continue living there or keep it as a cash flowing rental. And who cares if it's underwater uh, in terms of uh, in terms of you owe more than it's worth as long as it's cash flowing. It's putting money in your pocket every month. Yeah, absolutely. So Bigger Pockets obviously has tons of amazing resources for people who want to get into stuff like this. Uh, are there any links in particular you'd recommend, or maybe you can just send them over and I'll put them in the show notes in case people want to know more? Sure. I mean, I'd recommend people start from the source. So the first time that I can figure out anybody actually using the term house hacking was by a guy that works here named Brandon Turner. And he wrote how to hack your housing and get paid to live for free. And he uses the example of a quadplex, I believe, in that post. But I'll, I'll be sure to send you that link. And so listeners can go ahead and click on that in the show notes. Perfect. And so that was your first 100K. So, you know, the, the first 25K was focused on frugality and cutting expenses. Uh, the next 75K, you know, you're looking at housing and income generation. So do you want to talk about that final step? Yeah, sure. So the, the final step, I think, is goes on forever, basically. And I think that the two things that come into play there are going to be entrepreneurship, asset creation, and then investing. So once you have, a, a, you know, $100,000 in investable liquidity, if you're spending less than twenty five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a year, by definition, that means you have years of financial runway, years of the ability to go and take advantage of opportunities, or just like simply the cash to make a meaningful investment. So if, at least relative to your spending. 
So I think there's a couple of schools of thought. First, there's the traditional, and there's nothing wrong with this plan of index fund investing. Throw all of your additional cash into index funds, model it out using whatever percentage percentage return you're comfortable with. A lot of people will go with something in the 8 to 10% return range for index fund investing over the long term. Um, but you model it out and you just throw all of your excess cash into a big pile, and then one day you have achieved financial independence according to – uh, the standard definition, I guess, in the FI community, which is the based on the 4% rule. So if you spend $40,000 per year, if that's your target goal, and you have $1, you know, $1 million in index funds uh, or, or in wealth in general in your portfolio, you're likely to sustain that in perpetuity. So that's one plan, and there's nothing wrong with that plan. And, and I invest in index funds. I have you know, a, a very sizable chunk of my money in index funds for that exact reason. Another approach that I also use is real estate investing. So alongside kind of dollar cost averaging with index funds, I try to dollar cost average, and by that I mean consistently invest, so I'm not buying at the top or the bottom of the market, in real estate. And I just mentioned I have the three properties, and I plan to buy a fourth by, if not by the end of this year, by the end of 2018, by at least by kind of spring 2019. So kind of continue my system. I bought my last property in June 2017. So those those are kind of two approaches for investing. But there's also this whole realm of entrepreneurship. And I encourage people to go out and think about adding side hustles one at a time as they're going down this path. If you can, you know, there's so many different ways to make money that don't cost anything but your time and maybe like a few hundred to a few thousand dollars to try out. You could try starting a blog or a podcast. I mean, that that obviously worked out for you, Brandon. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Like this is like the most opportune time for low cost entry into any sort of business world you can imagine, which is super exciting. And and I, I couldn't agree more that that's also that should be a very important focus for you because if you just work so hard to financial independence and then have nothing to work on after or nothing that gets you out of bed or gets you excited about you know starting your day once you reach that point you're gonna probably be pretty miserable and may want to go back to work but having that thing that you're working on as you're trying to reach financial independence then hopefully by the time you reach it, you'll have something there that you're really passionate about and that you can spend a lot of time doing. Yeah, I think that's huge because, you know, it's kind of a funny phenomenon to me because, you know, when I was starting out on this journey, all I was, all I could think about was getting to a point where financial independence seemed like a, a realistic possibility. And, you know, now that I'm there, I guess I technically lean FI, but I have more work to do if I want to get to the point where I can kind of support maybe uh, an upper middle class lifestyle with, you know, in a good school district and a family one day, um, I definitely have still some more work to do to get to there. Wait, but, but, yeah, let me interject. But, to you. Yeah, <laughs> I, I was yeah. listening to your podcast, which we'll obviously talk about here soon as yeah. well. Um, and yeah, you, you, your last name's Trench and you want how many Trenchlings? Oh, seven Trench, seven to 10 Trenchlings. <laughs> right. So yeah, that could, that could take a nice chunk of change. Yeah. So yeah, you better, you better <laughs> keep saving a little bit because seven to 10 Trenchlings, I'm sure aren't going to be too cheap. Yes. So I, I definitely have some higher financial goals than kind of like lean FI for me and maybe like one significant other. But uh, uh, and I and I'm and I'm plenty happy doing what I'm doing and kind of continuing things, uh, continuing along with things. But it's funny because I hear these people that are like, oh, I'm about to, I, I'm very well into FI. I'm easily a two or three percent uh, with safe withdrawal rate, which is much more conservative than the four percent safe withdrawal rate. It means they have much more assets than they need to produce the level of income that they desire. And they're just like, I don't know what I'm going to do after I retire. It's just the, the money is not the fear anymore. It's just like the the leap and the and I guess the freedom is almost kind of the scary thing. So I think that you're absolutely right to have a passion project, whether it's personal finance related stuff or a podcast or a, a blog or a project or a business in something else that you're just want to work on with your free time. Yeah, absolutely. So it sounds like you haven't made any sort of mistakes or you've been on such a very amazing path seemingly as soon as you got your career. So have you made any mistakes or is there anything you would do differently if you're starting from scratch now? Yeah, you know, I I had the good privilege and it, 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 this is not like an intelligence thing. I had the good privilege to discover this kind of personal finance movement and have it make sense to me very early on and then just kind of dive in and read it. So I was able to basically 
from a big picture perspective, I think that I've been able to at least avoid any major mistakes. So my major mistakes are going to be things like I bought a brand new Toyota Corolla in 2014, um, kind of before I really wrapped my head around the whole personal finance thing. And that's a Corolla. It's not like I bought an Escalade. Right. It, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, it cost me 17 grand and I still have a little bit to go to completely pay it off. It's like a 1% interest rate, but that was, that wasn't a huge mistake. I picked stocks and I tried to invest in stocks and I lost money in 2000 and f- 2013, 2014, when everybody else was making money, all the index fund investors were seeing strong returns. I managed to lose money because I knew better than the market about this couple of Chinese stocks that had more <laughs> cash than market cap. And I don't know. Oh, wow. Uh, nice. Yeah. So, so they're yeah. not, they're not even recognizable by name, the companies, if you, if no, you I was, I was, I was interested in like finding like these like weird financial ratios. Um, <laughs> no, here's, here's what I was thinking. So, you know, I'm, I, I was like, oh, I'm a smarter guy than the market. You know, this company in China is a, f- a Chinese fruit juice company, and they've got $100 million in cash and no debts, and their market cap is $50 million, and they're profitable. So, I mean, you think about that, like, how on earth is their market cap less than that? Well, the reason is because Chinese companies all the time, I, I don't know about this one in particular, lie about their <laughs> financials, and no one can go in and, and audit them and figure that out. And everybody knew this except for me. <laughs> So that's how I managed to lose money uh, investing in stocks, I guess. Nice. Well, um, it's good to make those mistakes early, and that's that's uh, the good thing. Like you don't have to be a superstar investor when you don't have much to to risk. Luckily, and that's hopefully when you make all your mis- mistakes and learn all those lessons. Yeah. So I I think that the big from a big picture standpoint, I was able to think about it in a pretty rational way and have odds in my uh, odds in my favor for success. Some of it is obviously also luck, and I think that that's, that goes right along with what I just said before. It's about increasing your odds of success, but understanding that some things are out of your control with alongside that. And you know, here I am today after a string of, I think, good decisions and good fortune accompanying them. But I look back and I'm like, I'm not sure which one of those was a bad decision where I got lucky. Hmm. I think they were good decisions – and I got lucky, if that makes any sense, in terms, and, and particularly in terms of appreciation in the real estate and stock markets. And I really think you make your own luck to an extent as well. Like obviously, some chance plays a part, but when you're putting yourself into the position to take advantage of opportunities, and you do have options, and you do have that buffer, like that first twenty five k that we talked about, and you're able to take advantage of things that other people can't, and then yeah, it may look lucky after the fact, but you know, I think a lot goes into putting yourself into position to to be lucky. Yeah, you know, I just I, I rarely do this, but I just read a book that I'm I'm raving about lately called Thinking in Bets by Annie Duke. Um, and she's a poker player. And poker players just have this yeah, or at least the ones that are really good and, and her have this really good outlook on things where they're like, Hey, you know, here's the hand I've been dealt. My odds of success of winning this hand, based on what I know, are Seventy percent, and I think I can read my opponents as well as I can to feel comfortable with those odds and set myself up. I'm going to bet on that and go with that, and that's the correct decision to make in that game. And they're fine with that. And if they lose, you got to be able to not tie the result of losing that hand with the with hey, oh, that was a bad decision to bet there. No, it was a good decision. You made the right choice. It just didn't work out. And if you continue kind of along that line of thinking and apply it to your life, I think that's how you have a really these, these really good odds of of hitting success. Now, of course, you can't make any bets in the first place if you have no wealth and spend all that you earn. You have no ability to even attempt to put yourself to put some money on on that or put you know take the shot on that new career or whatever. So you have to have kind of some baseline of stability. And then all the and then, you know work as hard as you can to acquire excess so that you can then go on to take these chances in life that you believe to the best of your ability are great and then obviously do whatever work you can to increase the odds as much as you can in your favor. Very cool. I'm gonna put that book in the show notes, a link to the book in the show notes, and I'm gonna hopefully get it out of the library as soon as I can because that sounds really good. And yeah, back in my poker watching days, uh, yeah. I remember Andy Duke very well, so that'll be cool to read that. So I mentioned your podcast uh, briefly, but I definitely want you to talk about it because your co-host is one of the people that has been on my show probably more than anyone else. She, I yeah. interviewed her and her husband in episode 14. She and her husband interviewed me in 26, and then they both were co-hosts on my show with me on episode 38. 
So she's a fantastic. There was some rapping involved in that show. If there I was, and that, that's that is my question. So, so yeah, Bigger Pockets Money podcast. It's great. I've listened to probably half of the episodes so far, and I'm looking forward to checking out the rest. Your first guest was the same first guest that I had way back in 2012. So, Mr. Money Mustache, which was a great episode. Yeah. So my question was, has she rapped yet? Because she is actually a really good rapper. So. You know, she hasn't rapped yet. I take, I think I take all of the thunder for the, you know, weird uh, or funny, whatever you want to call it, uh, activities there by telling very lame dad jokes on each <laughs> yeah. episode or asking the guests at least. So yeah, yeah. Uh, but we'll have to get her to rap on one of the future ones coming up. Absolutely. Yeah. No, she's good. So yeah. So the bigger punny, bigger pockets money podcast. How's it been going? Have you enjoyed it? Oh, I've been. I I I love it. So. The the Bigger Pockets Money Show started as kind of a spinoff, an alternative to the Bigger Pockets, I guess, real estate podcast. And one of my and I think Mindy's big pet peeves with the real estate community is that a lot of people will go in and try to buy real estate and hope that that buying that real estate will solve their financial problems. So they're investing from a position of financial weakness and using some form of creative finance, which is kind of for a new investor, often code word for extremely risky leverage mm. and not investing from business of, of financial strength. So the goal of this show is to say, hey, real estate is one part of a strong portfolio. And I believe it makes sense for many people. But really what we're after here is a strong personal financial position with a good savings rate, a strong income, strong investment returns, and then the opportunity, if desired, to go take advantage of entrepreneurial pursuits. So we are interviewing people that have expertise in one of these areas or niches in these areas or stories that embody this kind of approach uh, so that people are not pigeonholed into one type of investing or one type of real estate. Um, so, for example, you know, on the on the basic level, Mr. Money Mustache uh, was, a, was an incredible intro because I believe, and, I, and Mindy agrees, that the base, you know, basis of personal finance, the foundation, is always in that kind of frugality and having the mindset of the end goal of happiness and using money as a tool to live out that ideal lifestyle. I guess, you know, and then we kind of move into more niche topics with future guests. Um, For example, we had Aaron Chase on there, and Aaron Chase is an expert grocery shopper. And groceries are one of the things that a person that's interested in personal finance can go out and make a change in immediately. You may not be able to change your lease. You may not be able to start biking to work tomorrow, but you can next week go to the grocery store, plan out your meals, and save a few hundred bucks on your your eating bill and eat healthier and, and kind of bring that advantage into your life. But then we go into house hacking. We go into um, kind of just incredible personal stories. One of my favorites, uh, which will be coming out soon, is with uh, David Green, who's a real estate investor. But we don't talk about his real estate investing. We talk about his personal financial journey where he started as a waiter and found ways to make way more money than all the other waiters at the restaurant. How he saved all that money, how he was able to house hack, how he was able to you know, parlay into, very, into his career – you know, as a police officer, how he was able to save and accumulate tremendous amounts of wealth while most of the people, most of his peers, and this is in San Francisco, this is in like an expensive market, were not able to accumulate anything. So the goal of the show is to kind of showcase these different perspectives on finance and enable people to kind of think outside the box of, oh, real estate's the only way to go about this, or or even index funds, the only way to go about investing, or frugality is the only path to financial freedom. No, all of these things work, and it's about putting together a plan that makes the most sense to you based on the perspectives of you know, smart people who have been there and that resonate with you. Very cool. Yeah, I'll put a link to the first episode in the show notes, and yeah, I definitely recommend everyone check it out. So I always end all my interviews with one piece of advice you'd give to somebody starting on the path of FI. So what would yours be? Get to a 50% savings rate. I think that 50, a 50% savings rate kind of get – to, get to a median income – and then get to a 50% savings rate. I think that once you have a 50% savings rate on a median income or greater, that's when all of this kind of really starts falling into place and the opportunities begin multiplying in so many different directions for you. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been awesome. And thanks to Mindy for putting this together. And she was right. It was definitely worth talking to you. So uh, lots of great advice. And if people want to find you, where's best to, to find you online? Just go to Bigger Pockets. 
Yeah. So, so I'm on a lot of social media, but I don't ever check them. I find social media like very overwhelming. So the best place to find me is actually on bigger pockets and just kind of search my name in the search bar, Scott Trench. And if you message me there, I usually get back to everybody within a day or two. Very cool. Well, thank you so much, Scott. I appreciate it. And hopefully I uh, make it out to, to Denver one of these days and say hello. And I've never been to Colorado and I love mountains. So hopefully it'll happen. <laughs> Well, thank you, Brandon. I, if I make it out to Scotland, I'll have to come and, Absolutely. and check that out. You're welcome anytime. All right, man. Thanks a lot. Congratulations again on the promotion and the book. And yeah, hopefully speak to you soon. Thank you so much. All right, buddy. Bye. Bye. Hey, hope you enjoyed that interview with Scott. Before I go, I just wanted to remind you that I went back through all of my previous episodes and collected the answers to my final question that I always ask. What's one piece of advice you'd give to somebody on the path to financial independence? And I put all the answers into a free PDF that you can download. So if that's something you're interested in, head to madfiantist.com slash advice. That's madfiantist.com forward slash advice. And you can download a free copy there. And it contains all of the answers I've received since I started this podcast back in 2012. So there's a ton of great stuff there. Anyway, thanks a lot for listening. And I'll see you next time. Finance.